Hey, hello students. I uh, thought I'd make a little bit of extra uh, examples. Uh, in class, I got a chance to do three, wanted to do five. Um, and so for those of you who kind of figured it all out after three, you're not necessarily going to need this. But I started this one and, and uh, kind of paused on it, realizing there wasn't going to be enough time and I wanted to show you a calculus one. So I thought I would make a quick video of this one and then another interesting one on, on 108. So these are two hard ones that I think would benefit a lot of people to kind of kind of seeing them here. And so let, let me just read 49. It says here, you, you throw a ball straight up with an initial velocity. So maybe I'll kind of make the ground here. And you have this ball and you're going to throw it up with an initial velocity of 15 meters per second. Okay, so it goes up and it passes a tree branch on the way up at a height of seven meters. So somewhere about here, seven meters off the ground uh, from where you threw it, uh, it passes a tree branch. So obviously it's going fast enough to not only get seven, but it sounds like it's going to go even higher than that. It says here, how much additional time will pass before the ball passes the tree branch on its way back down? So it would go up and eventually come to a stop and then return. All right. So what I was trying to explain in the lesson, and so I'll repeat here, is maybe ask yourself here, is this a constant acceleration problem? And since it is under free fall, I would say yes. The acceleration is a negative 9.8 meters per second squared, or what we might call a negative g. All right, so, so we know the acceleration of this, and we know it's constant. And the big thing about that question is if we know it's constant, then we can use one of those five kinematic equations, or maybe I'll just write the first two because the other three were just rearranging these two. And so this was kinematics equation one, and this was kinematic equation number two. And then let's see, I guess we first solved for time, put it into here, and we got equation number three, which didn't have time in it. Then we solved for acceleration, put it into here. We got the equation that uh, was missing acceleration. Uh, and then we solved this for initial velocity and put it into here, and we got an equation for um, uh, that didn't have initial velocity. Anyways, uh, I don't think I need to write all those down. You have them. And I don't think we're going to need this because if I'm, I'm looking ahead, uh, let's talk about what we know and what we don't know and, of course, what we're looking for. So putting these five variables here, I would have, okay, final speed, initial speed, acceleration, time, and distance traveled. Okay, so looking at those, my, my five parameters, I would say I, I have this one right here. I have the uh, acceleration. Also, they gave me the initial as 15 meters per second. So I, I do have that. The thing that made it kind of hard in this problem is they really are lacking both of these uh, I don't know the speed. Of course, now there's kind of the question, what do I mean by final speed? Do, do I mean the speed on its way up or on its way down? Uh, I also don't have the time, uh, although they are looking for the time from here back to here. Uh, so keep that in, in mind, that this is the one they're looking for. Uh, I, I do have the distance, of course, it depends what you're looking at here. This is why this is a harder problem, but I have the distance as it goes from the ground on up to here. Uh, so that's seven, okay? Now, here's something that makes this problem very interesting is because the 
height, or I should say the displacement, not the distance traveled, is 7, whether it's going up or coming down. Now, that's going to be important here in a second, because let me just do this. Let me, let me just say that it seems like the appropriate equation would be the one that doesn't have final speed. I don't know the speed one's going up. I don't know the speed's going down, although I could argue they're equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So one's a plus and one's a minus. So I kind of know their connection. But I don't know that, that one. And maybe that's just as well, because if I think of it that way, I'm looking for this one. But I'm also looking for something, not just the total time of flight. So this, so this is a little bit more complicated in it. But let me step away from that and just look at equation number two. Because equation is number two is the one that I said is the one you want to use if you don't know and aren't looking for final velocity. Now, again, this is, this is a little harder problem. So let me change it for a second and just ask... Could you solve this for the time it takes to go from here up to seven meters? See, I guess you would say, well, well, well sure. If, if I call it starting point zero, so initial position is zero, so there's my origin, and I ask this question, when does it get to a height of, of seven? Okay, so there's the height of seven. Knowing it starts with an initial speed of 15, okay. Knowing that it has an acceleration of negative 9.8. So I'm going to put the negative out here, and this will reduce to a 4.9. But you can see right there, I can answer this question, how much time does it take to get there at 7? Now, again, it's not really the question they're asking. They're asking for the time to go from here on up to its highest point and then back down. But maybe this could be useful to figuring out how much time it takes to get to here, and then maybe I can figure out the rest of it. But if you're clever here, and this is why this is an interesting problem, it actually has got multiple ways of doing it, but I'm going to have you dig deep into your mathematics and say, hey, wait a minute, is this a quadratic equation? Uh, time is squared. And so that means when you solve a quadratic equation, you have to use that quadratic formula. And they get two answers. Oh, why, why would there be two answers here? I mean, if you throw the ball up, shouldn't there just be a time it takes to get here? Ah, remember... This is the time when it's at position 7. And it actually is at position 7 two different times. On the way up and on the way down. Ah. So now that I think about what these equations mean, and I put it together with the math being quadratic, if I were to solve this, I would have two answers. Because one of the answers would be the time for the ball to go from the ground up to 7. But the other one would also be the time when it's at 7, which would correspond to it going all the way up to the top and coming back down. There's actually two moments in time when it is at a position of 7. So it's not a surprise when you think of it that way of why there is two solutions. And if I can then just solve this, I will have the time it takes to go up to the 7 the first time, but I will also have the time it takes to go all the way up and then back down to the 7. And once I have both of those, I can answer the real question in this, which, which is the time that it would take to go from the 7 back to the 7. And so when I get these two times, I'll just subtract them. That would be the time difference between each of the moments in time when it goes to seven. So, that's my approach. Noticing that I don't know final velocity and notice that this is a quadratic and it's going to give me two solutions from when it's at seven. So, each of these moments in time will be when it is at a height of, of seven. All right, so I've got a little bit of algebra to do. And I also thought this would be a good one to do because it is going to involve a quadratic equation. 
and I didn't get a chance to work with you with quadratic equations, and you might have forgotten that. I, I was focusing my attention a lot on the calculus, but I know the quadratic ones can also be a bit challenging. Now, if you remember the way to solve a quadratic equation is to write it in what we call a standard form. That is, put everything on one side. And it doesn't matter whether you put them all on the left or all on the right. I just decided that I'll go left. And so the negative 4.9 goes to the other side and becomes positive. The 15 goes to the other side and becomes negative. The 7 is already on the left. And so this is my quadratic equation. And so maybe you remember the formula minus b plus or minus the square roots of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And like I said, this is really one of why I wanted to do that. You may not remember completing the square and having to solve a quadratic, uh, but you're going to need it a number of times because a lot of mathematical formulas do have a quadratic nature in them. Okay, and these a, b, and c are the coefficients in, in front. Uh, maybe I'll get a colored marker here. So this would be the coefficient a, uh, this one here would be b, and this one here would be c. So solving this for time, I would say here, take the opposite of b. b is a negative 15, so the negative of a negative is a positive 15. Uh, then it's b squared, and negative 15 times negative 15, which is 15 squared, is 225. All right, minus 4 uh, times a, so that's 4.9 times c, that's a 7, all of this over 2 times a. And of course, a is 4.9, so I multiply by 2, and that'll be 9.8. So again, notice it's a plus or minus. That's why we're going to get two answers. Maybe I will then just write what this square root uh, comes out to be. And I'm going to then take the 15 squared, so 225. Uh, I'm going to subtract the 4 times the 4.9 times the 7. I will then take its square root, and then this is actually a 9.37. All right. So, why don't I do the subtraction one, which would be the smaller time first. So, 15 minus that last answer. And that divided by 9.8 gives me a time of a little bit over a half a second. I suppose I should ask about my significant figures. Uh, I just wrote it here as 15 going up, but they did say 15.0, so there's three. I wrote it as seven, but they write it as 7.00, so there's three there. Uh, ultimately, I think I'm probably limited by saying the acceleration is 9.8. I could have done better and gone 9.8, but here's the problem. It depends where you are on the Earth. It averages about a 0.6 which would round to a 1 if I did more significant figures. But if I'm high in altitude or near the equator, this drops to be under a 5, and so it rounds to 9.80. So that's why we kind of avoid that last one, because it kind of depends where you are on the surface of the Earth. So going with two significant figures, I'm going to say that the time of the smaller one, and that would be the time going, going up, would be 0.57. I'll put a comma because the other one then would be 15 plus, and I'll just go up here and copy it and paste it. That's a little easier. And then hit enter and divide that by 
9.8. And so the second one to, and I probably didn't say it well, uh, I really should do two decimals because I'm ultimately adding and, and subtracting here. Uh, but I'm going to go to the two decimals and, not, and call that three significant figures, but the same precision. And so 2.49. All right. So what this equation is telling me is from the ground on up to 7, it takes 0.57. Then there's a, some more time so that the total time is 2.49. And if I subtract those two, that would be the time interval between those. So 2.49 minus 0.457. And so 2.49 minus 0.57 gives me a time of about 1.92 seconds between the ball going up and coming down at the height of that branch. So that's hopefully a good one. I, th I thought that would be a, a good one to see and a good one to do. All right, so let me then jump over to the other one that I wanted to do. Uh, I thought I wrote down the number. Ah, it was a number 108. Uh, and this was from the harder book, uh, the one that I usually use to do uh, calculus from. Although I say usually, I've only done it one time so far, but you'll 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 see that. But it also has some tougher problems. So this one doesn't actually have any calculus in it, but it does have a challenging problem in it. And uh, let's read it here because there's again a little technique that I wanted to show you. So same thing, I picked this one. I wanted you to see the quadratic equation worked out. This one has something a little different. So let, let's read it here together. It says for part A, a world record was set in the men's 100 meter dash in the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing by Usain Bolt from Jamaica. Bolt cro uh, coasted across the finish line with a time of 9.69 seconds. And uh, I, I remember watching that. I know it was, what, wow, 14 years ago, but it, it was an amazing race. And it looked like he was coasting. It was, it was incredible. So huge break in, the, in lowering of the world record. Um, if we assume that Bolt accelerated for three seconds to reach his maximum speed and then maintained this maximum speed for the rest of the race, calculate his maximum speed and his acceleration. Now, let's start with a good physical picture on this, because you're going to hear me keep saying this. If You really can't do this until you kind of have a good physical picture, and for me, that means kind of doodling. I don't, I'm not a good artist, and I don't draw pictures really well, but I got a good picture in my mind. So if I'm kind of doodling here, I say, okay, well, maybe this is the start line. I'll put a little S for start, and and then over here is the finish line. And since it's a 100-meter race, I know that distance. So let's not forget the obvious, that this whole race is 100 meters. But as I read that carefully, it sounds like, and I've seen a lot of races, the gun goes off, and these racers accelerate. And at some points, they reach a maximum speed, and then they're just running full sprints the rest of the way. Now, here's why I say that, because what would be the acceleration during this, I'll call the second part, second, I don't want to call it half, because it's not equal, but the, the second part of this race. And so remember the definition of acceleration is the change in velocity. So I would say that they're trying to say here indirectly 
that during the second part, the acceleration is zero. You might say that's a constant acceleration. It's just a value of zero. But the other thing here is the first part of the race, there's probably some very large acceleration. It's definitely not zero. I mean, that's what makes the the, the individual start the race, and in this case, Hussein Bolt, where he starts with zero speed and he goes faster, 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 and then he keeps that speed. So when I always start this first question, is this a constant acceleration problem? I guess we have to say no, or at least we have to say no to the whole problem. And that's what I wanna show you. Because technically, this is not in a constant acceleration for the whole problem. So applying any of those five equations, equation one, equation two, equation three, equation four, equation five, that are only valid for constant acceleration, I would get it wrong if I try to apply that equation for the whole race. But... What I could do, and this is why I wanted to do this problem, is to divide this race into two pieces. Because during each of those pieces, there is a constant acceleration. And so as I mentioned above, during the second part of the race, the acceleration is a constant value of zero. And during the first part, it has a constant value that's not zero. And I, I, I don't know what it is. But if it says here, if we assume, if we assume that Bolt's acceleration accelerates for three seconds to its maximum speed, um, they kind of imply that he has some value to his acceleration, some constant, because later on in the problem they said calculate the maximum speed and his acceleration. So, so I'm going to go with the idea, they could have done a better job, that they're trying to say during this first part there is a constant non-zero value, and during this part they make it very clear it's a constant zero value because he maintains a constant speed and there's no change, so the change would be zero, and so I'm going to do this. I'm going to apply these kinematic equations, whichever one I need to solve, but I got to do it in pieces. I can't do it in one big shot. And that's what makes this a harder problem because I got to break it into two pieces. It would be even harder if it was, you know, something like this. Uh, you accelerate, go at a constant speed, and then slow down. Now, I suppose you wouldn't do that to the finish line, but after the finish line, you would slow down. So they could have had a deacceleration here and then have a total distance that would be more than 100 meters, and you would have, have to break this into three pieces. You would have to have the acceleration as they're speeding up, the acceleration of zero when you're a constant speed, and then I'd have to put a third column in here that would say, okay, what's happening then on that next acceleration? And that is a little too much for this class. So we probably will, at most, will have these two constant accelerations. So we have to make two columns here. All right, now, let's start working this out because I would say another obvious piece of information is they gave me, in part one, three seconds. I mean, they, they just straight up say that uh, if we assume that Bolt accelerated for three seconds. And indirectly then, they gave me the time during the second part because remember, they gave me his time for his world record. So the whole thing takes 9.69 seconds. So if the first three seconds are used up during the acceleration, if I subtract three from this, this is 6.69 seconds. So we know the times, and those are just directly given. Uh, maybe the three is a little more obvious, but but this one's here too. It's 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 pretty clear. I think they're really giving you that. It's it's three seconds off of that. Okay. Uh, do they give me the distance? Um, not. 
for peace, and so maybe I'll call this x1 and this x2, but remember back here, they gave me the whole thing. So maybe I should say, well, what x2 is right here, and I'll cross it out and say x2, or maybe I should have just said equals, is actually 100 minus x1. And that, that's how we got the time, and that's also how we'll get the, the distance over here. We just got to subtract over this one. But the thing is, they don't directly give me that one. Okay. Now, I know my strategy has been saying, hey, focus on what they don't give you, but that only really works if they've got one acceleration. If they give you two sets of information, that's like two different sets of equations, so there's really two things that they may not give you. And I would argue here that probably the thing that is of least significance for this problem is what is the, um, no, I was gonna, I was gonna say the speed, but we're gonna need to transfer this over. All right, well, let me keep going. Uh, because over here in part one, although they didn't explicitly say it, I would say they're telling me the initial speed, right? I mean, this is a race. Now you have to have, know a little bit about track and field, I guess, but a race starts from rest, and so, Hussein Bolt is at the starting line, down, probably crouched down on the starting blocks and getting ready to go, but his initial speed is zero. Of course, then he goes faster, 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 and he gains some speed. But here's what's interesting. Whatever speed he got to in part one is where in part two, that is going to be his initial speed. So this initial speed over here is the final speed. So I'll say final speed from part one. And that's how we're going to tie these together. And like I said, we did the X2 over here by tying it together. In fact, I think we should probably look at final speed and distance which would be equation one and equation two for a moment. So equation one would be V equals to V naught plus acceleration times time. And in part one, we know the initial speed is zero. The acceleration is unknown, but the time is three seconds. I'll just change the order to make it look like we normally do in a math class, we put the number first. So three times A is the final speed. See, and that can be then useful over here for part two. And so I would say this is a three A. And so that's how they tie together. The ending speed for part one becomes the initial speed for part two two. Okay. And so this is kinematic equation number one. And then of course, position is kinematic equation number two. So let me say x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. And this x one that I'm talking about then would be Hussein's starting position. And of course, here's where we have that freedom to pick the origin anywhere you want. Uh, as I was saying in the lecture, you know, just make it very clear in your mind where you want to call it, whatever is useful. I would say call the initial position zero unless there is some valid and important reason not to, but I, this, I would so that that one can go to zero. No, we already said it's a race. So a race starts from rest or at least a running race. Uh, this then would be one-half A, and of course, as we said already, the time is three seconds here. So this would mean that the position, how far Hussein travels before, they just he just keeps going at a constant speed, 
would be this 3 squared, which is 9, divided by 2, so that would be 4 and a half A. And, of course, I can then use that over here to say what is the position of it. Um, let me not actually put it, well, let me try to squeeze it in here. I shouldn't have drawn that line there, but that'd be 100 minus 4.5 A. And I shouldn't have crossed out the X2. Because let's do the same thinking over in part two that I just did in part one. Let's look at these first two kinematic equations. And the first one, I don't think is going to be very useful. Because during part two, the acceleration is zero. So what that says is whatever the starting speed is in part two is the same as the ending speed in part two. Of course, I mean zero acceleration. And we already really have that information, as we said from back here, the final speed in part one would be the initial speed in part two. So this would be a 3a, and that would be the final speed. Um, I, I really don't think having the initial as 3a and the final as 3a really gets me anywhere. But I wanted to work through it, see where it got me. You never know what might help. But I really think the big thing is the x2, because I can put it into here. So the x2 would again be the initial position plus the initial speed times time plus one-half at squared during this second part. Ah, and this looked very promising. See, because I would say what is the starting position for number two well, that is the ending position here, right? So this ending position would be the 4.5a. The initial velocity here is the 3a, and the time is the 6.69. Oh. Um, I should be a little careful here because I just messed up an important definition. And maybe this is a good thing to see because when I did this, I said this is how far it travels in part two. So I was calling this as a position of a zero and I was redoing my origin. But yet when I just did this step, I was saying X number two is the position measured from the original origin being the starting line. And I think that's probably a better way to go because then I can say that this final position of number two is 100. And so that's where I was kind of going with this, that the, the movement of X1 and the movement of X2 is 100. But I could have got myself into trouble depending on how I think of part two. It's, is part two, is, am I putting a new origin right here or am I keeping it for the whole problem? And I, I think it's better to keep it for the whole problem. So that's why I'm going to say the final position of number two is 100 meters. 
whereas this term right here is the starting at 4.5a, and then this is that distance that uh, they travel because of that constant speed of 3a for the 6.69 seconds. And for that, I'm going to need a, a calculator. So 3 times 6.69 is a 20.07a. And then, if I add these together, 4.5 plus the last answer, that is a 24 point five seven a times a hundred and now I can solve for one of these problems which is what is a so 100 divided by the last answer giving me an acceleration of about 4.07 a so that would be the acceleration now of course once I know that I can answer the other part, which was back here. What is the speed for the second half where you, he keeps a constant speed? So we can think of that as the final speed from number one, or we can think of it as the initial speed for number two, which, as we said, is the same as the final speed. So either way we want to look at it, there's a 3a everywhere. So I'm going to take that value for a and multiply it by 3, and we're looking at a speed of about 12.2 meters per second for that speed during the second half. All right, well, I hope I got across what, what I wanted to get across, and that is, look, there is this set of problems where you can still get away using the constant acceleration equations, even if it's not constant for the whole problem, it might be constant for parts of the problem. And then you can just take whatever the ending speed in position in number one is and apply it to number, number two. And that's what I, I wanted you to see. So very much a hard problem, but not out of the realm of possibility. I think you can handle this one. This one is just... Uh, more complicated and needed some time and that's why I thought I would take a little extra time and uh, say well you should look at this this hard one this is a this is a real good hard one so both of these the 49 and the, the 108 I just didn't have enough time in class but they're really advanced ones and got some neat techniques in there now technically 108 has a part B uh, it asks you to do the same thing when Hussein Bolt runs the 200 meters uh, but I think this video is long enough and got to its point, so I'll call it a wrap here and wish you a good day. All right, see you next time.